actually started uh, with the Olympics that were held at Lake Placid in uh, 1932. And uh, when the Olympics came to, to Lake Placid, they only had the Nordic events. They didn't have the downhill yet. The downhill didn't happen until 1936 at Garmisch Um, So there was a radio announcer named Lowell Thomas. And Lowell Thomas, uh, he was like a, a skier and an ambassador for skiing. And he really talked up the games and over the radio and everybody loved hearing about skiing. And it really got the itch going for skiing in America. And then <clears throat> skiing in the 30s, that's kind of what it looked like, kind of what the outfits looked like. And it was uh, a lot of people would uh, just go to farms uh, in New England and they'd find a place that had a nice hill and they would get up to the top of the hill and then they'd just slide down it and then they'd walk back up. And then eventually the farmers decided that they could put a rope tow up and they'd hook it to a tractor wheel and then they could make the, the rope go through and it was on a continuous loop and then people would hang on to it and they would they would ride up and ride down and uh, that's how skiing really started now the same thing was happening in the west that the people were getting the itch to, to go skiing because they saw how much fun it was and then as this began to pick up and that the uh, the rich and beautiful they would come from uh, New York and Boston and Connecticut and they'd go up to New Hampshire and Vermont and they they would take ski lessons and they'd they'd learn how to ski. And out west, the uh, the Hollywood crowd started uh, getting involved with skiing and they all wanted to learn how to ski. And there was different places out west, particularly in California, that wasn't too far away. And so for all of the young people out there, you probably, these names of stars that you might not recognize, but in the 30s and 40s, they were, they were pretty hot stuff. Um, and then I can, I can remember Groucho Marx uh, when I was a kid and he had his own show and, and he, he was a funny guy. But that, then the, there was guys like John Wayne and Clark Gable and Gary Cooper and Claudette Colbert. And they all took up skiing because everybody thought it was, <clears throat> it was the new pastime and the new thing to be doing, particularly Claudette Colbert um, she even went to Austria to take ski lessons, and uh, it was very important for her to, to get these uh, medallions and these rankings as a skier, and uh, she uh, became a, a client of Friedel Pfeiffer, and I'll talk about Friedel here in a little bit. And then uh, this guy out in California, <clears throat> Walt Disney, became real interested in skiing. And uh, there was a place called Sugar Bowl Ski Area. It's outside of Truckee, uh, which is up by Squaw Valley. And so Walt got real interested in it. And uh, this gentleman here in the sweater in the middle, his name is Hani Schroll. And Hani Schroll was an Austrian ski instructor and skiing champion. And so Hani loved to uh, yodel. And as he would give lessons and he would ski through the mountains there, Given lessons and taking his people, he would be yodeling and 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 Walt Disney fell in love with all of this, and so Walt Disney invested heavily in Sugar Bowl, and uh, they even named one of the mountains out there Mount Disney. So if you've ever seen the 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 cartoon of of Goofy and the art of skiing, uh, you'll see here Goofy yodeling. Well, that's really Hani Schroll <laughs> that's that's doing the yodeling. So that, that's what's happening in the 30s. And uh, in 1933, Adolf Hitler becomes the uh, chancellor of Germany. And as he becomes the chancellor of Germany, he decides that he's going to remobilize the, the nation of Germany. And there was a many prohibitions that were levied against Germany about mobilizing uh, from the Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles is what ended World War I. And so when Hitler takes over, he, he just ignores most of those prohibitions that were leveled uh, from the Treaty of Versailles. And he starts to remobilize. And the first thing he does 
is he starts rebuilding his army and he rebuilds his armament factories like Krupp Industries and he starts making uh, howitzers and cannons and tanks and airplanes and all and ships and submarines and everything else that was prohibited from the Treaty of Versailles. So on January, on the 7th of March of 1936, uh, Adolf Hitler re-enters what's called the Rhineland. And the Rhineland is a 30 mile strip of land inside Germany that's adjacent to the Rhine River. And it's the Rhine River is the border between France and Germany. And so as the German army goes back into Rhineland, it occupies that 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 miles those thirty miles of strip there of land, and uh, that starts to make the uh, Allies a little nervous. Now the Allies were England and France and America, but uh, they really didn't do anything about it. And Hitler thought it was one of the greatest uh, uh, gambles he took during the whole war. So uh, that's where it begins. And then two years later, on the twelfth of March, he annexes Austria. And when he does that, that's called the Anschluss. And that happened on March the 12th of 1938. Now, if you've ever seen The Sound of Music and you've seen how the Germans marched into Austria and took over and the Von Trapp family had to leave and all that, well, that's, that's when it happened. It was uh, March the 12th of 1938. And then <clears throat> as he's taken over the Rhineland and he's taken over uh, Austri uh, Austria, the Allies still didn't do anything about it. And they said, uh, well, that's, uh, we're not going to do anything about it. He's already taken it. So that's good. So then Hitler says, well, there's part of Czechoslovakia that I need also. And that's called a student in the same land, those areas adjacent to Germany that had German speaking people that lived there. And so this is now when the, the, the uh, allies, England and France begin to get very, very nervous about Hitler taking over, uh, taking over what he's doing. And, I'm, and as he, and he starts to take over, they say, okay, we'll, we'll let you take that, but that's, that's all, you can't take any more. And he says, that's okay, because I don't have any more, uh, I don't have any more territorial ambitions. And so, but he, so they say, okay, so then you had what was called the Munich Pact. And the Munich Pact is when Mr. Chamberlain and, this, and Mr. Dadelier from France, they come and they make this pact with Hitler. And they say, okay, we're going to let you take the Sudetenland, but that's it. Uh, you can't, no more. And he says, oh, that's okay, because I'm not planning on taking any more. And they said, well, because if you keep going, then it, that's going to mean war. And so Hitler say, agrees to that. And then Mr. Chamberlain goes back to England and he waves the white piece of, of paper and he says, we will have peace in our time. And so it was right after that then that he on the, on the, on the 30th, let me see, what's the date? The, uh, the uh, September the 1st of 1939 is when he invades Poland. And so when he invades Poland, then Britain and uh, France declare war. And so that happens. And so September 1st, 1939 is the date that historians say that that's the date that the World War II began. And what Hitler had to do was he was going to invade Poland from the West moving East. And he had made a deal with Joseph Stalin that if you let me invade, he says, I can't fight a two front war. I don't wanna fight England and France at the same time and fight the Soviet Union at the same time. So if you come in out of the East and invade West, uh, you can take the, those lands that you can capture plus the Baltics and they, they had a deal. Uh, that was the, the pact that they, that they made. And <clears throat> after when they started on the uh, first of, of uh, September of 39. Then two weeks later, the Soviets invaded on the 17th of 1939. And because the Germans had already destroyed the Polish uh, army, a lot of it anyway, the, plus their air force and everything, the, uh, in, the Russians were emboldened. So they decided, well, since this went so well and so easy for us, we should invade Finland. 
And so on the 30th of November of 1939, the Soviet Union invaded Finland. But the Finns decided they were going to fight back. And the Finns were accomplished on skis and in the snow, and they could fight. Well, the Soviets came across the Finnish border with a half a million men, over 4,000 tanks and armored personnel carriers, and they were invading. And, and as, they were fight, as the Finns were fighting back, America had a, a young guy named David Bradley. And David Bradley was a former Dartmouth skier who was a, a really good uh, cross country skier. And he worked for some magazines and, and newspapers. And he sent reports back to America telling uh, what was happening in the war between the Finns and the Soviets. And as he did, um, he, he started the attention of the War Department and General Marshall and McNair about what was going on. Now, so what they what the, did was they had come across with all of the locals, and all of the locals means that they have to stay on the roads. And as they had on the roads, the Finns came up with a tactic called the Mahdi Tactics, and they would drop trees across the road at the front end of a column and, try, and trees across the back end of a column so that the Soviets couldn't maneuver off the road. And then they were trapped in their vehicles, and then the Finns would fire them up. And then at night, the Soviets would get out of their tanks and their vehicles and start a bonfire to keep warm. And then they'd also come under ambush from the Finns, and they were really annihilated. So the Finns annihilated two whole divisions, the uh, 163rd and the 44th Motorized Division in this manner, uh, because the, the, the Soviets were just trapped. They also de destroyed one NKDV regiment, which was like a regiment. They were, the Finns were killing so many of the Russians, the Russians were beginning to wonder, well, where are we gonna put all these bodies? Um, because the bodies were, were piling up so, so much and uh, they had to deal with this, but the Finns were only really able to carry on this fight during the winter while it was, while there was plenty of snow and the, there were plenty of cold temperatures. So back in the United States, people were listening to reports about the war and they were listening to the radio and they were reading it in the papers and they were reading John, uh, the reports from David Bradley. And so uh, in February of 1940, there were four guys that met at this lodge. And this lodge is at the foot, it's a, at Bromley ski area, still there. It's in uh, Manchester, Vermont. And right at the bottom of the ski area is Johnny Seesaw's Inn. And this is Johnny Seesaw's Inn as, a, as it looked back in 1940. And the, <clears throat> the four guys were, Minnie Dole, Roger Langley, Robert Livermore, and Alexander Bright. Now, Minnie Dole was the head of the National Ski Patrol. Alexander, um, Roger Langley was head of the National Ski Association. Robert Livermore and Alexander Bright, they were both skiers on a 1936 ski team. So they'd skied all day, they met in here, and they started thinking about the war and what was happening in the war. And they said, what if, the Germans came across the Atlantic and they invaded Canada. And if they invaded Canada, they could come right down the Champlain Valley and invade New York. And at this time, America has no defense, uh, no wintertime capability to fight the Germans in, if, if anything like this should happen. So we need to approach the War Department and General Marshall and to develop a capability where we could fight in the mountains and in the cold weather. So they decided that Minnie Dole would take that on board and he would begin a letter writing campaign to the President Roosevelt and he, to General Marshall and General McNair and try to figure out a way to develop a capability in America that we could fight in cold weather because America had not fought in the winter time and cold in the snow in 100 or over 100 years. So as many do begins this letter writing campaign, then events in the, in the world continue to escalate. <clears throat> in April of 1940, the Germans invade Norway. So when they invade Norway, uh, they go up there to take over the iron ore fields and the, uh, the ports and the warm water ports in the North Atlantic. And when they did, uh, 
Great Britain and, and France and, and Poland, they sent troops there to help the Norwegians uh, push back the Germans. But the, they sent about a brigade of Brits, and that was Mr. Churchill's idea that they go there. But they were surrounded by the Germans and they were ignominiously defeated and had to be withdrawn. And so the, Mr. Churchill had to bring those, those troops home, bring, get them out of there. So that was in April of 1940. Then in May of 1940, Germany invades France, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, and he goes through these countries uh, in about a month. And so there was no uh, turning back the German army as the German army just looked absolutely incredible. And uh, they, they looked like they were just the Superman of Europe that couldn't be defeated. And so it was becoming more and more of a crisis in America because America's army was very small, um, only around 200,000, uh, maybe 250,000 guys in the US Army. So as we see that, that Germany is so big and so powerful and so strong and that's overrunning everybody, it, it, it's, it, it's, it becomes a big question about, should we mobilize? And so the draft was reinstated in America and it kept going and we had to start rebuilding our own uh, forces. Then uh, Mussolini was uh, the partner of Adolf Hitler. And as Mussolini sees there's going to be a reorganization of Europe and he wants to be part of that on the winning side. So he decides he's going to uh, attack his longtime uh, nemesis and enemy, the Greeks. So to get from Italy to Greece, you have to go through the Balkans, which is Albania. And so as the, he starts to march through Albania, he says to Hitler, mein Führer, we are on the march. So Hitler, what this was, was livid because it upsets his whole timetable because Hitler's got to take care of one thing at a time. And as he's invaded all these other countries, he doesn't need he doesn't need to be helping Italy out with their problem with, that they think that they have with, with the Greeks. So I've got a question here. OK. Um, it says, hi, sir. I've got one question, and, and I'd like to thank you for this great talk. I see some of the early development of ski troopers as military competition among nations, even though it clearly was a major advantage over certain adversaries. How much relevance does that concept represent today with ski mountaineering, Arctic warfare, and other military capabilities on the snow? From Mark Stanfield. Well, Mark, we're kind of uh, behind the power curve there. We don't, the US military has precious little ability on skis. Um, the special forces, have guys, particularly 10th group, uh, have some special specialized training in uh, on skis. Now there are units that have skis that uh, try to develop a capability. Um, the Colorado National Guard has, guy, has one company that has skis. The Marine Corps has a training center that they do some training on skis, but for the most part today, we use snowshoes. Um, the, the most modern snowshoes, so which are smaller, not as big and bulky and heavy as the previous snowshoes. But we really don't, we really don't have much of a capability on skis. Okay, all right. So let me let me go on here with the casualties. Um, the winter came early in uh, the Balkans, and uh, the Italians had huge casualties, more than ten thousand. Italians died of exposure and uh, an additional 25,000 battle deaths from fighting the, the Greeks. Now, again, we had a, uh, this time we had an, uh, an officer, a Lieutenant Colonel L.S. Giraud. He was there and he accompanied the Greeks and he was, he was writing back reports to uh, the uh, department, the war department and the army and telling them then what happens when you don't uh, visit or train to fight in the cold snow? So it would behoove the United States to develop a capability. Well, no. So now we have 
several examples of what happens when they're fighting in the snow. We have the Finns fighting the Russians who've done a good job. We've shown what the Brits did against the Germans in Norway, which was a bad example. Now we see that what the Italians did in the snow against the Greeks, and that example. So they're getting to figure out at the War Department that we probably need to be, get serious about developing a capability. Now what the capability was against the adversaries, the Germans in 1940 had three mountain divisions. By 1945, they had 14 mountain divisions. The United States had none, um, and the Germans were very good. They had their, the German mountain troops uh, mainly came from Bavaria and Austria, and they knew they were mountain climbers, they were skiers, they were hikers, they were guides. They had, they had a lot of capability um, at their disposal in the troops that they had. So now as we get more and more intense, then the War Department goes back to Minnie Dole. And they said, okay, you've been advocating that the United States needs a cold weather capability. It needs skiers that you keep telling us that, uh, so what would you, how can you help us? And so Minnie Dole says, okay, I can help by I can, ask the United States Ski Patrol to start training soldiers on skis. So at this particular time in 1940, uh, the end of 1940, they, the Army asked Minnie Dole to, to help. And so he said, so he writes to the 93 different uh, ski patrols in the nation to ask them if they would help uh, with the uh, training of soldiers on skis in cold weather. And so the army says, all right, we'll do it on a volunteer basis for 19, in 1941, because we're not gonna train in the South. So they picked up, they picked five different locations and six different army divisions for volunteers. And so they went to Plattsburgh Barracks, New York, Old Forge, uh, New York. They went to uh, Fort Snelling in Minnesota and they went to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin and then in, in Fort Lewis in the state of Washington. So there's two places to train on the East Coast, two in the Midwest and two out West at Fort Lewis. And so at that time then, that's the first year is January, February, March of 1941 when they, they trained the volunteer patrols. And so Minnie Dole has begun now working closely with the army and he's right, continues to write to President Roosevelt and General Marshall about, and, he's, and he <clears throat> emphasizes the reports that are coming from Europe about the fighting that's going on in the mountains. Now, the ski patrols uh, were just a bunch of volunteers that, that went to these different locations to help skiers when they got hurt because the equipment wasn't like we have today. Um, and there were turned ankles and broken thumbs and broken legs and broken knees and all, all manner of other injuries. And the ski patrol had primitive toboggans and they'd put a guy on it and bring him down to the base and then they'd turn him over to a uh, clinic and to two doctors if they're if they available. And sometimes they just got the people, the wounded people back to their cars and then they had to drive home back to wherever that was. So uh, that, that winter of 41 turned out pretty well. And so the, the reports went back to the, to the War Department and the War Department says, all right, I think that we need to stand up some soldiers, a unit of soldiers that can fight in cold weather and fight in the snow. So they, uh, they sent the message and the, the first battalion of mountain soldiers is created. And that's the first battalion of the 87th Mountain Infantry is designated a, an outfit on the 15th of November of 1941. So that, and then they give Minnie Dole a contract to start recruiting and using the National Ski Patrol 
as a recruiting agency for the Army. It's never happened before. It's never happened again that you have a civilian organization that is recruiting for the Army. So that happens on November the 15th of 1941. And then Minnie Dole goes out and he sends out the word that we're recruiting for this battalion of mountain troops, the first mountain regiment. And so there's notices in newspapers all across the nation where they have snow and where people ski. And then 22 days later, uh, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. So now America is at war and America is uh, gonna be in World War II now. And then eight days later, uh, Hitler declares war on America. So now men from all over the nation start accumulating down at their recruiting stations and at their draft boards saying that they're ready to go and they're ready to sign up. So now the <clears throat> army comes back to Minnie Dole and they say to him, all right, we need your help now more than ever to uh, start recruiting. And we need, we're going to need uh, 3,000 guys in 60 days. Can you do it? And Minnie Dole says, yes, I can do it, but you've got to let me do it my way. And so Minnie Dole goes to these people that he knows. And this young, handsome young guy up here in the left-hand corner of the screen, his name is John Jay. And John Jay is a filmmaker. And he is a, from an old, family from New England. His, he is a direct descendant of the first Supreme Court Justice, John Jay, that was appointed by President Washington. But John Jay uh, went to Williams College, but his real passion for life was making ski movies. And he always had his camera with him. And you can see in this picture, he's got his camera on him and he's carrying a rifle on his back. This is taken up at Mount Rainier. Um, and so John Jay has a couple of different films. Uh, one is called Ski Here, Senor, and the other one's called Ski the Americas, North and South. And so he says, we need to, to recruit skiers. So how are we gonna recruit skiers? Well, I have a friend, this pretty young girl, and she is a skier and a ski instructor from Dartmouth. And she's a, she is a, a ski instructor at a place called Oak Hill, which is in Hanover, uh, New Hampshire, which is where Dartmouth is. So he gets, Debbie Bankart is her name, and she takes John Jay's ski films, and she goes around to the universities that have ski teams, and she goes all around the country showing these ski films and recruiting guys for many dolls, uh, the mountain troops, the ski troops. And she hands it, she shows the movie, she narrates the movie, she hands out the uh, applications for the ski troops. Now, what Minnie Dole has done is he said, in order to get into the mountain troops, into the ski troops, you're going to have to fill out an application. And in that application, you're going to have to have three letters of recommendation. And I will do the vetting. I will look at every one of these applications. And if I find that the guy is suitable, then we'll hire the guy and we'll bring him into the ski troops. So that was something really, really unique because you don't need to fill out an application to get into the infantry. Um, this is unheard of. So that's what he does. He sends out these, uh, these two. Well, she, she's the one that majorly, majorly does it. And it was said that she sees over, she gives the, the movies to over 70,000 people in America. And so Debbie was the one that was really doing the recruiting. And then if a young guy wanted to join up, he'd fill out the application, he'd get his three letters of recommendation. He'd go down to the, see the, uh, the local ski patrol office and they would get work his paperwork through. And then he would get sent out there to the ski troops. He didn't have to go to recruit training like everybody else. He went directly and that's the way that Minnie Dole had it set up, which made it a little bit difficult for him at first. And then he was advertising everywhere. He was sending out letters in magazines and in newspapers and everything else with ads like this that were seen by a lot of different people because most of the young men in America were, were joining up 
particularly if you were healthy enough. And uh, so that's, that's how it was going to go. So the first year, <clears throat> the winter of 1942, they all went out to Fort Lewis. Now, Fort Lewis is 65 miles away from Mount Rainier. So in order to get to ski country into a mountain where they, you could do the skiing, you had to get bussed up there. And, but what they did is they rented two ski lodges, the Paradise and the Tattoo Lodge. Um, we got one, so, one question. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, was was this was she only East Coast? I think she's uh, talking about the woman on the last slide. Um, was she East Coast? How did the West Coast three letter men uh, GT or get recruited? She went out there too. She went out to, to Seattle and Portland and uh, Northern California, San Francisco, um, Reno. She she. She had her own train tickets, see? And then she had these, these big films were on those big reels and they were like a suitcase. So she would carry a suitcase and then these reels in her hand and ride the train to all of these different places. And then she would show the movies and she would go downtown to the Rialto, let's say, or wherever, whatever the movie house was and Denver and she would show the films. And then these young guys would see this pretty young girl and they would come up. And then, well, I, mean, I mean, she undoubtedly went to Boulder uh, and she undoubtedly made, probably went down to DU in Denver. But uh, no, she, she crisscrossed the nation. Every, every place that they had skiing, she went. Uh, 70,000 people that she, she'd seen. Okay, so go back. And so now we're, we're going back to the Paradise and the Tattoosh Lodge. This is 1942. So this is like the first battalion of the 87th. And these are all guys. Many of these guys had participated the year before into the volunteer program. And a lot of these guys were, these guys were already in the army. And so now Minnie Dole is recruiting more and more of these guys for the army. But the guys that Minnie Dole was recruiting and the National Ski Patrol were recruiting, they could already ski. And so they were, they were already pretty qualified in that, but when they got out to, to Mount Rainier, they had to learn military skiing. So military skiing is a lot different than downhill skiing for fun. So they had to learn to ski with a pack on their back, carrying a rifle. They had to learn to cross country and they're doing cross country movement on skis with heavy gear. And so as they, they started to do that, and that was all of the winter of 1942 that they were out there and, but they really had a fun time out there living in the ski lodge. And uh, this was a very prominent ski lodge right outside of Seattle. And so there was a lot of people and they had, a, they had girls come out there and they could ski on the weekends and all the rest of that stuff. So it was really, it was really good for those guys in the 87s. That was called the original group. And that's when most of the ski or most of the ditties and the songs that were written were written out at the Paradise and Tattoo Lodge. So, so the army decided, well, we're going to have to build us up to probably the size of a division, and we can't in ski areas, so or ski lodges. So where are we going to build a, a camp for these guys? So they send out Hurtis and Walker, two lieutenant colonels, and a guy named Monahan from the Forest Service to look for a place where they could build a camp to house these these guys that were going to be the ski soldiers, the, the ski troops. So uh, Onslow Rolf is the CEO now of the 87th, and they start looking around and they come up, they look in Wyoming and Montana, and they look at near Aspen, and they find uh, Eagle Park, Colorado. Now this is actually just a wetlands, but it's part of the forest, and, uh, and so they needed to find a new place where they're going to build up. So what do you need if you're going to build a new camp to house a division? So keep in mind is divisions about then uh, about 16,000 guys. And so they, they got to find a place that's big enough and it had to have plenty of snow in the winter and it had to have rocks adjacent to it close by for rock climbing in the summer and for and it had to have a hard surface road and it had to have a railroad stop. So they came up with this place 
and it was called Pando, Colorado. Is it was an old whistle stop, and is what Pando was was a ice station that they could that the trains would come up and they would get ice for the produce because the there was a lot of produce grown in Colorado. They would use the ice to keep the produce uh, cold, and then they, the trains would keep on going. So they they found that Pando was suitable and that the area was big enough to build the camp. So that's what they decided to do. They're going to build a camp now in Pando, Colorado. And that's what it was. That's how it was all referred to for the first couple of years was just Pando. Um, they didn't call it anything else. Now, a little map orientation. And I think probably most of the people here understand this. Now, this gold line, if you can see this gold line where my arrow is going, that's I-70. And then you, <clears throat> for those of you, uh, Copper Mountain is located right here. And when you get off of I-70 and you come down, this is Highway 91. It's just a two-lane two road. You get down to Leadville. And then when you get to Leadville, you go up 24 till you get to, to Pando and where Camp Hale is going to be built. Um, so Camp Hale is about 15 miles from Leadville. Um, and that's where we're gonna, that's where we're gonna build uh, the, the new Camp Hale. Hold on just one second. So they begin building Camp Hale in April of 1942. They work on it through November of 1942. Um, and they bring in all of these contractors. So there's all kinds of contractors that come in there. So there's road guys that have to build roads and through the camp and they have to pave it and they have to, they have carpenters and plumbers and electricians and every other kind of thing. So there's all these thousands of, of contractor guys that come in from all over the country to, to build Camp Hill. But, you know, we were building camps all over the United States at the same time. So that's what this one was. So it's, uh, it's named after uh, this guy. Oh, wait a minute. Let me go back one. Hold it. Well, it's named after this guy, Brigadier General Hale. He's a Colorado boy. He graduated from East High School in Denver. Um, he went to the West Point. Uh, he was in the Spanish-American War, and then he ends up being one of the founders of the VFW. But uh, Brigadier General Hale is the one that uh, this camp is named after, good man. And, uh, he, and so when they started building it, they had to straighten out the Eagle River. And the Eagle River is there today dredged out as straight as a string going right through the camp just like they did it in 1942. So uh, they had to build over 800 buildings uh, in the camp. It cost about $31 million in 1942 to build a camp. Um, so today with inflation, it would be about as much as it cost to build a football stadium uh, like the one in Las Vegas. And that's what uh, Camp Hale looked like in uh, 1942, 1943, with all of the barracks, because it's going to end up housing about uh, 12,000 soldiers and about 4,000 mules. Um, and this is uh, we're looking here. We're looking north out of the camp from here, and this is kind of uh, civilian. And this is the where the women were barracks, and and then there was a a guardhouse back here at this north end of the camp. Um, and the, 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 the camp CP is right over here. Um, so, so that's kind of what it looked like. And then with all those mules, um, everybody had to go to mule school and to learn how to pack a mule and how to take care of mules and feed them and water them, curry them and muck out their stalls and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, because why do you need so many mules? Because when you're a mountain trooper, you go where places where they don't have roads. And so you're up there fighting in the, in the mountains all the time in the back country. And you can't, it's, it's too, it's a lot, a lot of work to try to carry all the impedimenta that has to be taken back there with you. Tents and, and food and ammunition and water and fuel and everything else that has to be packed on a mule. So many Dole has to expand the uh, application process. Because he, he, he still needs skiers, but he has to have lumberjacks and blacksmiths. And so he expands the application process to include guys that can live out, uh, live rough, 
and live outside in the cold and in the climate in the winter time. So he had rodeo champions like this guy, Jim Like, and he said he was just getting good at rodeo before he went to the army. Um, Paul Petzl was a, was a big US climber, real young guy. He was uh, part of the team that uh, almost made it to the summit of K2, but one of the guys on K2 got sick and he had to come down. He did that when he was 18. Um, and he was known as the highest man in America uh, because he had climbed that, that he was on that team that climbed K2. Um, Peter Gabriel was a, a Swiss climber and mountain guide. Uh, he came to the United States and he was one of the head of the ski schools back in New Hampshire at Franconia. But his main claim to fame was he was a guide, a mountain, a Swiss guide in Switzerland. And this guy was uh, also Swiss. Um, and he was known as the greatest, the world's greatest skier. Uh, he had won the Kandahar downhill twice in 1931 and 1933. Walter Prager was his name. And uh, when he came to America, he became the coach of the Dartmouth ski team. And he uh, coached the Dartmouth ski team, who was the, the best ski team, college ski team in the country. In eight years in a row, they, they, won, they won everything. And he, he fielded a whole lot of Dartmouth skiers who went into the 10th Mountain Division. And they went in, number one, they knew him and they knew that they wanted to be a skier and they wanted to participate in skiing during the war. Then you had the foreigners. These, both these guys are Austrians, Tony Mack and Lugi Fugger. Um, they were both Austrian skiing champions. They got out right, at, <clears throat> right after the Anschluss began, made it to America, and uh, they both joined the, the 10th Mountain Division. And now some of the, the big famous guys was uh, Frio Pfeiffer. And he got out uh, right, uh, bef right at the beginning of the Anschluss. And he, he got out a, on a boat and he made it down to Australia. And then he got a hold of one of his former clients, Claudette Colbert, and she brought him to America and she got him a job up at uh, Sun Valley. So he became then the head of the Sun Valley Ski School and he later was the founder of Aspen, Colorado. And then here's John Jay. He was already a big ski guy, a uh, filmmaker. Steve Knowlton was an Olympian, a US uh, Olympic ski team member. And he went on to Colorado and stayed in Colorado. He came up with the term Ski Country USA and he started several restaurants. This is Larry Jump. He was a 10th Mountain guy, and he's the founder of Rapahoe Basin. Um, Pete Seibert uh, was a Massachusetts guy, and he joined the 10th when he was about 18. <clears throat> and he's the guy that is the founder of Vail. Um, so there, so there were several of the young guys that did pretty well with them when they got to the 10th. This is Toga Torkel. He's a Norwegian. He's the world champion at uh, ski jumping. He held a world record of 289 feet at the time. And it was said that Togar could jump up on a, with a pack on his back up on the supply counter and land flat footed. Okay, so now we get to 1930, uh, to uh, 1943. And this red dotted line here is uh, what's called the great, this, the furthest extent of the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. And the the Japanese had invaded and taken some of US territory, the island of Attu and the island of Kiska. And so the War Department can't tolerate that. And so they say, okay, we're gonna to have to send somebody out there to fight the Japanese and take, kick them off of Attu and Kiska. So the first ones they sent is seventh division, which was just a regular in, uh, infantry division. Uh, the, the Japs put up a huge fight up on Attu. Uh, they even did a bonsai charge. And when they did the bonsai charge, they, all of the Japanese were killed. And so including their, their general and their commander, was about 2,000 guys on an Atu. About 750 guys from the 7th Division got killed on an Atu. But there were still, they thought, about 2,000 guys on Kiska. So he said, okay, we got to do something about Kiska uh, still. So what are we going to do about it? Well, let's take the guys that are trained in cold weather. So who's that? All right, we've got the 87th Regiment that's been training out at uh, Fort Lewis. And so the, now they're at Camp Hale. So let's take them and we'll send them out to Kiska to eject the, the Japs. So they, they decide to have a task force that they 
form and the task force is for Operation Cottage is for the invasion of Kiska. And this is gonna take place in August, August 15th of 1943. 34,000 troops are in the task force, but you've got the 87th Mountain Infantry, parts of the 7th Division who had previously been, been on ATU. You've got Canadians and you've got Navy Air um, flying off of uh, flat tops. So, and there's a couple of battleships that go out there too. That's what they, uh, that's what the invasion force looked like that was gonna land on Kiska. And what the planners thought was that there was only, there was about 2000 or 2,500 Japanese on the island of Kiska. So they land, uh, the, the 87th is, has got the job of going in ahead and taking the high ground. So they get them up early, about three o'clock in the morning. It's still dark, but it, you know, it's August. So that far north, the sun comes, it's, the days are very long. And so you, they get up, they get, they get ashore, and then they climb up the hills uh, right in front of the mountain there and to their objectives. And, uh, but it's, it's foggy. It's uh, very, very foggy. And it's so foggy, they can't see anything. Um, and so they get to the top of this mountain and they occupy positions in kind of a horseshoe shape and then as they did this this horseshoe shape uh guys start yelling and screaming and they think they see things and so they start shooting at it and they start shooting machine guns and guys are yelling and screaming and saying we need help down here we're getting overrun um get down here quick and help us uh well so they keep shooting and shooting but there is no japanese so when the dawn comes up and it's and it's light enough, they can't find any German body or any Japanese bodies. But is what they then they start to look because now they can see because the fog's pretty much lifted. Now it's just windy. Uh, they can't find any Japanese dead, but they've got their own guys who've been shot by each other. And then what we find is the Japanese have abandoned Kiska and they've sabotaged all of the stuff that they had left there. And these are some mini Japanese submarines that were left on Kiska uh, that they found. And in all, <clears throat> the Kiska casualties from the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment were 23 guys were killed and 55 guys wounded. All the friendly, all the 23 KIA were killed by friendly fire and booby traps. Um, so that was a real, real hard lesson for those guys. And they, they never really, really got over it because they, they remembered what they had done. Um, so they all had to go back, but they were out there till December. So they're out there from the 15th of August to the, uh, they start leaving in drips and drabs um, around the 4th and 5th of December. So, they get on a real slow boat because all of that task force that brought them out to Kiska is now gone. And they're, they're working up in the, the rest of the Pacific. Um, <clears throat> so they have to get a boat. There's a boat called the Denali that took them back. And it was just a, like an inner harbor ship that they had to use. But they get back to San Francisco and to Los Angeles. And then they go and leave. And then they got to be back to uh, Camp Hale in January. So I wanted to show you, but a lot of guys get back from, they get to Denver on the train, on the train, and then they have to get on the train that takes them up to, uh, back to Camp Hill. Now I put this picture in because I wanted you to see the smoke coming out of those, those trains. And there's at least one train a day and they're all uh, chugging out. It takes three engines to haul it up that hill uh, to get to Camp Hill. And all of that smoke and soot goes into the camp. And this picture, you can see some of the smoke that's in the air above the camp as the guys are, are marching here for a for a, a event that they're going to participate in. And but it would the what the guys got was called the Pando hack, and it was caused by all the coal dust that was in the air, and all of these barracks were heated by coal. So in the the valley where Camp Hale is is constructed in such a manner that all of that coal dust stays right there in the air. So what they love to do 
was get out of camp as often as they could uh, so they could get out and train where they didn't have to breathe that coal dust uh, continually. So in the summertime, they did rock training and land navigation survival. And you'd go out as a battalion and you'd get, you'd pitch your tents and then you'd have your chow out there and you'd have everything you needed out there in the field as you participated in the, the rock packages, what's called the rock packages or the, the uh, rough terrain, uh, land navigation, things like that. Some guys, there was a detachment that went back to Mount Rainier and they did uh, some glacier work and glacier uh, experiments to see how easy it or difficult it is to move a unit of troops across glaciers if they had to do it once they got to Europe. But they actually, they didn't know where they were gonna be employed. But for the most part, skiing was uh, the, the main emphasis of the training. Now, in the end, uh, Minnie Dole had recruited about 7,000 guys. Uh, the, the National Ski Patrol had recruited and they, those 7,000 guys that had their three letters of recommendation and they could all ski. When, they, when the division topped out, when they left, uh, when they left the United States for Italy, they had about a little over 14,000 guys. So about half of those guys had to be drafted and half of them and many of them came from Tennessee and Louisiana and they all had to be taught to ski. So they were being taught to ski by the numbers and uh, some of them loved it, some of them hated it, but they all had to learn how to ski. So, so in the winter time, this is kind of what it looked like. You'd have a squad leader and a, a, one instructor, and uh, he'd take those guys out and they'd hump the hills. There was uh, four slopes at Camp Hale and two rope toes. And then six miles up the hill uh, was a place called Ski Cooper, and it had a T-bar. And so they would take a battalion up to Ski Cooper for two weeks of ski training. And then they, after they had done the, the 30 days of training at Camp Hale, uh, getting the basic rudiments of how to ski uh, there at Camp Hale. And then they'd get out of, if they were on exercise or doing some kind of maneuver, they'd get their full over whites on and uh, they'd get out of camp and they'd be uh, learning to shoot, move and communicate. And that's how it went. And then they'd always use their, their mules. Uh, the mules were always in use the summer and winter. Um, and uh, it took a lot to uh, keep all the mule, uh, all those 4,000 mules. Each regiment had pack companies and each of the artillery battalions had pack companies of the mules. It took six mules to pack a howitzer. Now here's a young guy and uh, he, that looks like a mortar on the back of that mule. Um, so all of these guys had mules, and all they all names, and they all had to take care of them. And that's what a mule looks like that's fully loaded uh, by a, and I, it, like I said, it took six of them to move a howitzer, and it was a 75 millimeter pack howitzer. Then they had to experiment with different machines and things like an original snowmobile. And you see guys here trying to ski or behind it. Um, and then there was the weasel. The weasel had uh, three different variants, the T-15, the T-28, and the T-29. And these guys are ski oaring behind it. Um, and these guys are doing a little bit better job of ski oaring behind it. And this was, a, this was called a snow truck. It was made by Studebaker and they made thousands of them. Um, <clears throat> they used them at D-Day. The regular infantry used them. No, they weren't just for the 10th Mountain Division because they, they had a ton of these when they, on D-Day, that went ashore. Uh, the 10th Mountain, they tried uh, dogs for a while, but the dogs didn't work out too well because they took too many soldiers to take care of the dogs. So that had to go away. But for the most part, uh, it was manpower for a lot of things. So if, you, if a mule is old, overloaded, he won't go. And I mean, you'll have to take all the gear off the mule then you'll put it in packs, you'll put it on toboggans, and then the men have to pull it up the hill uh, themselves. And uh, when it's like this, when you're up there at Camp Hale and the environment around Camp Hale, it's cold, it's at elevation. Camp Hale's at 9,200 feet elevation, and it's windy. And you can see here the wind, the guys trudging up the hill uh, 
en route to their bivouac, wherever that's going to be. And they're pulling that toboggan full of snowshoes and other gear. And here's a, sometimes you have to unload the mule then you have to cut a track for the mule. And so that the mule will be able to walk through it. Because if a mule, if the snow touches a mule's belly, he'll just sit right down and he won't go any farther at all. So when these guys were in Kiska, about 300 women uh, were assigned out of Camp Hale. And so when those guys got back from Kiska, they were greeted by uh, the ladies when they got there. And the ladies worked in various clerical jobs. They worked at the hospital. They worked at the PXs. Uh, they were drivers. They were mechanics. They did all kinds of things. And their, the morale of the camp really started to come up because the camp is now building up to around 12,000 guys. Uh, Minnie Dole continues to uh, advertise in places like Life Magazine. This is Walter Prager on the cover of Life Magazine there. And guys are still putting in their applications. Hey, Tom. And then, yes. Uh, we, got a, we got a question that came up coming, going back to the mules. Um, uh, Lori Alexander asked if they brought the mules to Italy with them. No, they did not. And they did not because there wasn't enough shipping. Um, shipping ruled the, every decision uh, that America was facing for the war. Because keep in mind, you had the war going on in the Pacific and you had the war going on in Europe. And so there were so many ships and they were building ships every day. Well, during the war, they were building Liberty ships and everything else. The ships, the mules that were at Camp Hale were eventually shipped to Burma. Um, when they get down to uh, Camp Swift, they had to get new mules. And so they had, the army had to find a whole bunch of new mules for them. So let me go back to 1943 to uh, when Warner Brothers comes out to Camp Hale. And Camp Hale, they, they do it because the movies, they were always dying to see films about their soldiers and what the soldiers were doing. So they came out there and, and Warner Brothers were there and they made a movie called Mountain Fighters. And it was a Technicolor movie and it was a pure uh, uh, propaganda film. And, they, and, the, and it's, it's 21 minutes long, and it, but it's great. And it's all in Technicolor. And uh, that was a huge recruiting tool that uh, Debbie used and that Minnie Dole used as they uh, were trying to fill up, continue to fill up the ranks to make a whole full division of uh, ski trains and winter trained soldiers. So the, the soldiers had to continue to train regardless of what the weather was like. Um, this is the rifle range, you're out on the rifle range. And uh, regardless of the conditions, you had, you had to get your training in, you had to get your qualifications in and, and, and that. And then when you're out there at Camp Hale, like I say, it's 15 miles away from Leadville, so what else, you know, what else are you gonna do, you gonna do out there? So you see every, all these soldiers around the world are thinking about these two, Rita Hayworth and Betty Grable, the top two uh, pinup girls of the whole war and everybody had their picture. <laughs> and if you could get to Leadville, one of the watering holes was this place, um, the, the Silver Dollar. Still there today, it's like that just like it did 75 years ago. Um, and we, every time we go up to Leadville, or we go up to Ski Cooper or whatever, there's an event up there. We all go there, we all pour into the Silver Dollar. And right in on the left-hand side there, as you go in the door, there's a picture of a bunch of the guys from 1943 in their uniforms that are in there with their patch on their sleeve. Okay, but sometimes um, Leadville was off limits. Yes, sir. Uh, we had kind of a follow-up question. Sorry to go back to this again. Um, someone, uh, Lisa Scalenberger, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, asked, uh, did they end up, or she said, but didn't they end up getting mules in Italy? They used the Italian mules. The Italian Alpini had mules, <laughs> and the mules in Italy were used by both sides, <laughs> okay? So the Germans were using them, and the Americans were using them, and the Brits, and the Brazilians. Um, where, uh, but the, the mules were, the, and they were much smaller. The, 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 the mules that were used in Italy were not nearly as big as the mules we had in America. 
but we knew how to use them. We knew how to load them. And, but when we got to Italy, our guys, the US soldiers didn't have to do it because the, Ita the, the Alpinis, the, the Italian Alpini soldiers, they're the ones that handled those mules. Okay. <laughs> a lot of, you know, the mules always get a lot of, uh, a lot of press. They, everybody's interested in the mules. Okay, so you can't always go to Leadville because in Leadville, um, there's a lot of miners in Leadville and there's prostitutes in, in Leadville. And if a soldier gets some kind of venereal disease, gonorrhea or a clap or something like that, that's willful destruction of government property. And uh, then you can't work, then you can be subject to uh, disciplinary measures. And so it was off limits sometimes, uh, but not all the time. <clears throat> and they could go there uh, after things kind of cooled down, but there was fights with miners and, and soldiers would get sick from the prostitutes and stuff. So, so they wanted to keep a close handle on it. But most of these guys, uh, they, didn't, they didn't get involved with that. All of the veterans that I've talked to, they didn't involve themselves with prostitutes, neither in America or in Italy. Um, not from the 10th. And another place they would love to go was to Aspen to go skiing. And that the Aspen at the, at the Hotel Jerome in, in Aspen, still there. It's a, on the National Historic Registry. And uh, these guys would go, and there was a guy named Lawrence Elsha that owned the hotel. And he would let the guys there for, to stay overnight and have breakfast and dinner. And he charged them a buck apiece. Um, and I love this picture because one day, I was skiing at Arapahoe Basin and I meet a guy because I've got my 10th Mountain sticker on my helmet. And he and he says, we start talking. He says, my dad was in the 10th. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. And he goes, you know that picture of the guy standing in front of the Jerome Hotel? I said, yeah, I know that picture. He said, you know the guy with the beer? That's my dad. <laughs> Here's a guy my age in his mid seventies and that is dad. Um, and these guys, all these five guys in this picture our uh, signalman and uh, the guy taking the picture, that's his car. And so all these guys drove over to Aspen to, uh, to ski and to stay at the Hotel Jerome. And uh, it's a, still a beautiful, lovely, perfect hotel today. Then sometimes they'd go down to Denver to the, to the Brown Palace. And uh, Steve Knowlton, so they, Steve Knowlton says that the Brown Palace was our, our unofficial headquarters on the weekends when the 10th guys would drive down to, to Denver. Now you could get to Denver on a train, which took too long, or you could drive if somebody had a car. So, so guys would pay somebody to drive them down there. When Steve Knowlton said he came back from, uh, from Kiska, it was New Year's Eve. And him and two other guys, they had a room at the top, they threw ropes down into the lobby and they repelled down into the lobby of the of the hotel of the hotel on, on New Year's Eve, and he said Steve said that we were met by the unwelcoming committee, and we told them we'd never do that again. So, so now we're into '44. So they get back up to Camp Hale, and uh, the big thing that for this year is going to be the D series, the division series. It's a division series test. Um, the war in Europe is still going hot and heavy, uh, but General McNair had a policy that everybody, the, every division that had to go overseas had to be tested before they could go. And that was called a division series of tests. So this test went in, in March and April of 1944, and, it, uh, and it, all 12,000 guys had to get out, out into the field. All, all three battalions of the artillery, we're out in the field, all the mules, all of the regiments, all the battalions, all the HNS people, and everybody else had to get out into the field. And as they they did this, one of the a big of the a large, large winter storm hit, and uh, and then they got dumped on like two feet of snow. Then the temperatures all went down to below zero, so there's all these guys out there. And uh, they're all suffering. And then, of course, when it's like that, generally speaking, the radio doesn't work, particularly the radios in those days. Uh, <clears throat> so you've got, you've got nine battalions of guys out there, 
plus headquarters units and every, and all kinds of people. And then you've got three battalions of artillery out there and the radios don't work and you can't get a hold of people. And so they have to bring in, bring it in early. So it only lasted three weeks, but it was a grueling, grueling. Some say that the most grueling test any army unit has ever done. At least they said that certainly during the war um, that this test was so, so difficult for these guys. So they come back into, back into Camp Hill and they're waiting around and then are just beginning to start the summer package, the rock climbing package. And then June the 6th happens. So when D-Day happens, um, all the events in Europe start to change. So that means that all of those soldiers that were in England have now displaced and they're all in France. <clears throat> so, so all these guys at Camp Hill are wondering what's gonna happen to us? What's gonna happen to us? So they get orders and they say, well, we're gonna use you, but we're gonna send you down to Texas and give you some more training. So these guys are like, what the hell? What are we going out to Texas for? So their, their biggest fear is that they're gonna lose their mountain designator and that they'll just be turned into a regular straight leg infantry unit. So they go down to Camp Swift, Texas. So while they're at Camp Swift, Texas, they're gonna, they're gonna get about 2,000, 2,100 more guys uh, and then they're going to get trained on our heavier artillery, heavier machine guns, and they're down there for about six months from uh, June to December that they're down at Camp Swift, and the training goes on, but it's more intense now. And as they get an influx of 2,000 more guys, each battalion gets a fourth company. Um, so that's, that's where they start building up to the, to the 14,000 mark but they also get this guy. So what happens on the 6th of November, um, the name change comes and they're now designated as 10th Mountain Division. Previous to that, they had been called the 10th Light Division Alpine. Now, uh, then on the, on the Thanksgiving day of 1944, Major General George Price Hayes is assigned as their commanding general. And Hayes is a gunfighter. He won, he was a recipient of the Medal of Honor in World War I, and he's a friend of General Marshall's, and General Marshall is gonna make him the division commander for the 10th Mountain Division. And so the first unit to go overseas is the 86th. <clears throat> and these guys still don't know where they're going. Hayes tells them, you are going to combat. I just can't, I'm not at liberty to tell you where at this time. So they go up and they have to go to Fort Patrick Henry, which is near Norfolk, Virginia. That's the big seaport up there where they're gonna get on the boats so they can go overseas. So the 86th Regiment is the first one to leave and, and they get to Italy uh, on, on Christmas Eve or the day before Christmas Eve. And who are they going to work for? They're going to work for this guy, General Mark Clark, who is the head of Fifth Army now. And back in 1940, when they were considering which, whether we should even have mountain troops or not, Mark Clark was a lieutenant colonel, and he advocated for it. He said, well, we can use at least another division, and it would be light enough that we could haul it and move it easier enough. So what, when these guys are told when they're on ship, you're going to go, the next stop is Italy. So when they get to Italy, um, <clears throat> they get to there and they see all of the, the uh, boats have been turned over in the harbor. Um, the, uh, the Naples has been bombed out by both sides uh, during the war. And it's a, it's a mess. And all of the kids are urchins in the street and they're begging for candy and they're trying to sell their sisters. And it's a whole new experience for everybody. And then the rest of the division ships out about two weeks later, and they all get there by uh, January. Now, who do they see when they get off the ship and they're walking down the gangplank, but they see the same girl that was going around the country showing the ski movies, Debbie Bankart. And she's there, she works now for the Red Cross, Red Cross and she's handing out coffee and donuts to these soldiers as they get off their ships and they come down, down the gangway. 
and here's Debbie. And she is uh, kind of, she works for the Red Cross, but she's kind of assigned herself to Fifth Army and to the 10th Mountain Division. And she goes around and she chases that. She keeps in contact, contact with them and she's bringing them donuts all the time. And she has her own Jeep and her own trailer and she makes her own, she has her own donut making machine. And all these boxes here, they're full of donuts and she's handing out to guys. Uh, this is a Petra Corolla um, later on. And that's Debbie. So she has quite a history with the 10th from being a ski instructor up at Dartmouth showing the movies to get guys to join the 10th. And then she's with them in Italy. And she's actually in Italy longer than the guys from the 10th one. So when they get there, they get down to Naples, then they have to take boats and, and uh, trains and, and trucks to get up to Pisa. There's a port here called, it's called Livorno. Uh, in English, it's, it's Leghorn. And so they're, they're assigned to the, to the 5th Army and they're gonna go in here in relief of, of Task Force 45. Task Force 45 was a bunch of anti-aircraft guys. I mean, we didn't need anti-aircraft anymore. So these guys were made into infantrymen, but the 10th is gonna relieve them in place. So all of this, all of these guys in blue, these are the good guys, this is us, and this is all 5th Army. Now, the 92nd Division is here on the coast. Genoa is over here on this edge of the coast. Uh, 10th is going to go here, relieve Task Force 45. This is the Brazilian Expeditionary Force. And these three divisions are under the command of General uh, Crittenberger. These, these divisions, these four divisions here, this is the South African Armored Division, the US 88, 34th, and 35th Division. These are under General Keyes. So, and all of these, this, all, this is all under General Truscott now, because General Clark has been uh, promoted and he is now the head of 15th Army Group. The 8th Army and the Brits are over here under General Lees on this side of, of Italy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna attack north. Actually, we're gonna be, our route of advance is gonna be to the northeast and that will continue to move northeast. So what the, the mission that General Truscott gives to Hayes is you've got to take this ridge. This is called the Piazzo di Campiano Ridge, what we know as, as Riva Ridge. And so he says, okay, um, I got to look at this and figure out how I'm going to do it. He says, okay, I'll give you some time. So what Hayes comes up with is this is the battle plan. Um, this is a hand-drawn kind of map of it. And here's the Piazzo di Campiano Ridge. And here's Mount Belvedere. Two roads leading to the Northeast, 64 and 65. The Germans have all of this ground and all of this ground and their, one of their headquarters is back here in Fiano. So this Mount Belvedere has been taken three times but the Germans always counterattacked and took it back. So they've got to dominate this ridge line because this ridge line is what dominates the two roads. You can't continue North until you take this ridge line and you've got to take it all and so that we can continue to push north and push the Germans out of Italy. In order to take Mount Belvedere, you have to take Riva Ridge first because what the Germans had done, they have artillery all on top of this ridge and right behind this ridge and they bring fires over here on top of Mount Belvedere. So what Hayes decides to do, he's gonna use one battalion. He's gonna climb this ridge at night. He's gonna hold this ridge for the next night, they're gonna attack Mount Belvedere. Now keep in mind, you got 14,000 guys in a division, you got nine battalions and you're gonna use them all. So the first night, the night of the 18th of April, uh, sorry, of 18th February of 1945, um, a guy named Wade Hampton is the battalion commander of the first battalion of the 86 and he's got one extra company from 286 and that's F Company, Fox Company. And Fox Company is going to attack way down here at this end of the, of, of the ridge. And the rest of the, the battalion is going to climb this ridge at night and they're going to hold it against counterattacks from the Germans. The next night, the rest of the division is going to attack Mount Belvedere, Mount Gorgolescu, all of these different hills down to Mount Torciata, which is way down here. So the first night, 
they climb, they cross, there's a river down here called the Dardagna, Dardagna River. And they climb that, they're, the big fight was over here at the end because this is the end of it that's the closest to Mount Belvedere where the best observation is. So they, they take the ridge the next day, the big fighting, they climb it the night of the 18th and then they're fighting all day the next day to hold it. They have to hold this ridge at the counterattacks for four days before they get relieved. Then the next night, <clears throat> the 19th, that these guys are gonna attack. So you got one, two, three battalions here of the 85th, they're gonna attack Mount Belvedere. Um, the second battalion of the 87th is gonna go around behind it. Uh, then the, you've got the first battalion of the 86th that's going this way. You've got the remainder of 286 because they've lost a company and 387 is gonna follow up with the 87th on this side. Uh, all, all set to take Mount Belvedere. Now to take Mount Belvedere, what General Hayes has said was, we're gonna start this as a night attack, but nobody can have loaded weapons. The only weapons you can use is grenades and bayonets because I don't want any accidental firing and I don't want any firing because the muzzle blast will give away your position and you might have shot some, one of our guys in the back uh, remembering what happened on Kiska. And he certainly didn't want that a repeat of that. So who's gonna do this? It's these guys. It's these guys, these guys that had their three letters. And all of these guys that were, were down at Camp Swift that were dripping about being so, so put upon and that they thought that they were not gonna be mountain troopers anymore. Um, a lot of those guys transferred out, but they had to stop the transfers. And it's these guys. All these guys with their three letters, all these guys that have been doing the ski training, all these guys that have been doing all that rock climbing. It's these guys. And so look how young they are and how vibrant and, and vigorous they look. And all of these guys, this, this picture was taken at Camp Swift. And so, and look at this guy up here on the top with his tongue sticking out. And I'll show you him again in a minute. Um, but this, these are the guys, these are the young guys. These are the young guys that we fight America's wars with. That's camp, that's uh, River Ridge that they're gonna climb at night. And uh, they're gonna go up that ridge uh, under in darkness. They're gonna take the top of the ridge in the morning of the, of the 19th of February is the, where the big fighting starts and they, they have to hold the ridge against the German attacks. Um, they're actually fighting up there for four days. Uh, and then the, the, the attack on uh, Mount Belvedere goes, but uh, during this time period, Togra Torkel, the greatest, the world record holder of the ski jump is killed. <clears throat> this is the top of Mount Belvedere after they've taken it. And you can see on the, by this photo that there's very little growth. This is all trees now. There are all, these are all huge trees. It's all covered in, in great big uh, leafy chestnut trees. Most Italy, as they work their way north, it looks like this, these little villages, with these little cart path roads that they're gonna trudge down and, and march up. And, um, and they've got the Alpini mules to help them. And they've got, now they've got vehicles too. Uh, <clears throat> so when you get a good road, you can have your, your uh, tank killers and tanks and things like that uh, follow up. And you'll notice that these guys aren't wearing packs. They're just carrying guns and ammo and they probably have a little food in their pockets. But that's what it looked like as you're as you're marching north north now, and you're going to take the sh shove the Germans out of out of Italy. So now we we're getting our work on our way north until the sixth of March, and uh, that's when they have to stop, and they have to stop in March because Eisenhower has taken their air force away, and they can't continue north now for a while. So they're going to stand down. Uh, from the 6th of March, 1945, until April 14th, till they kick off to go north again. So when they do that, then General Hayes gives them leaves and, and furloughs so they can go back to Florence and somebody can go to Rome and they can go to Genoa. They can go to different places that are back here that are safe to go before, we, before they have to do the kickoff again and, and get back into the war. So a, April 14th comes, and uh, April 14th is, is the day that the fog clears and they've got their Air Force back and the Air Force can uh, bomb the, the German targets that they're gonna have to, to hit. So as they, the 14th of, of 
February, I'm oh, sorry, 14th of April is the bloodiest day in the history of the 10th Mountain Division. That's the day that the most guys get killed uh, and wounded. And uh, there was a lot of them that day. And this guy gets wounded badly that day. Um, so he's a brand new second lieutenant and he, uh, he never set foot at Camp Hale. He never even set foot at Camp Swift. He was a, he, once he got out of college, he, he went and was assigned, he went to Italy and he was assigned to a, a, a unit that was a, a, one of the reserve guys that they shoved in uh, once the, the battle started killing second lieutenants. And the second lieutenants took the biggest hit in the whole war. 86% of the second lieutenants were hit, killed, or wounded. Um, but, and Bob Dole, when he got hit, uh, he was in the hospital for three years uh, before he could uh, recover. And uh, once he finally recovered, he got his law degree and he became a US Senator and a, and a candidate for president. This is the only Medal of Honor winner, uh, John McGrath. He, uh, he got the medal posthumously for his heroic deeds and what he did. Picked up a German machine gun, shot a bunch of Germans, uh, kept advancing, advancing, using a German machine gun. Uh, <laughs> then he killed the Germans, picked up their gun and took it away from them and killed them. They got up north to the Po River. And then when they got to the Po River, uh, Hayes didn't have the assets to get across the river. They, he got some, he did, did, some of his guys did some shenanigans to get some, some wooden boats. They got the wooden boats across the river until he could get the ducks. These are ducks. Uh, it's, a, it's a truck that can float and can go across the river. It could have, that can propel itself across the river. So they get across the Po River and now they're chasing the Germans and the Germans are retreating as fast as they can go. And the, uh, the Americans, are chasing them as fast as they can go. And uh, once Hayes gets across the river, uh, when he gets up to the river, Mark Clark tells him that he wants him to hold in place and he wants the other flatland divisions to pass through and uh, so that they could take the glory of taking the Poe. And Mark Clark and Hayes says, they'll have to catch us first. So then Hayes gets across the river, he gets his division across the river and so they continue marching and they continue going up to a place called Lake Garda. <clears throat> That's where they find Mussolini's castle. When Mussolini was cashiered by the Italians in 43, Hitler took him up to Lake Garda and put him in his house. And that's where, where Mussolini ran the fascist government uh, for, the, for the rest of 43, 44, and 45, until he knew that the Americans were on their way. He tried to escape, but he got caught. Um, when we got up to the river, uh, the assistant division commander was a named, guy named Robbie Duff. Robbie Duff got wounded and uh, Colonel Darby comes up and, and he had known Hayes and he had asked Truscott and he had asked Clark if he could stay and he could remain as the assistant division commander. You've probably heard of Darby's Rangers. Well, this is Darby. He was the founder of the, he was the CEO of the first Ranger Battalion. And uh, Colonel Darby, as they as they move up north to Lake Dar up to Lake Garda, uh, they get to the town of Torbola. And at Torbola, they're in there and they have a meeting. They are in there for lunch. They come outside, and a German 88 round goes off and it hits against the side of the hotel. And the shrapnel, shrapnel comes down, and it kills uh, Darby and the red and the 86 Regimental Sergeant Major. And that happens on the 30th of uh, April of 1945 and the 30th of April 1945 is the same day that Adolf Hitler commits suicide. Um, then on two days later, on May the 2nd, the Nazi armies in Italy surrender. <clears throat> and so the, what's gonna happen to the 10th is they have to stick around a little bit longer. General Hayes has to go across up Lake Garda. He has to pick up the German commander and take him back to Florence for the formal surrender. The German commander is General Ferdo von Sanger. Um, and von Sanger is a devout Catholic. And he's also a Rhodes Scholar. He can speak uh, five languages, but he speaks uh, perfect English. And he goes up to 
he's taken back to Florence to Mark Clark, and that's when he surrenders. Um, <clears throat> and after the surrender, all of the, the girls start to come out from all over Italy. This is a place called Castellano. Um, there was, this was the extreme limit there. This is where Bob Dole gets hit uh, on the 14th. Uh, in, but Castellano is completely rebuilt, but they rebuilt the uh, clock tower to look like that. So it's a modern looking place now. It's very, very modern and very beautiful place. And then the Italians started showing the Americans where all of the wine and the liquor is that they've hidden from the Germans. <laughs> and so the, 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 uh, the guys start looking around, finding all of this wine and booze and champagne. And what uh, General Hayes says, I want every soldier in my division to get two bottles of champagne and every officer to get a bottle of cognac. And uh, this guy is the father of one of my friends who's a descendant and uh, he helped put this brief together. So these guys are thinking about, okay, what are we gonna do now? Let's, what, what can we do for some, get some fun? So they found a, a bunch of skis that they, from the Italians and the, that the, for the Germans that they had left. And so they decided to have a ski race. So they find this place in the Julian Alps called Mount Mangiard. And then the 10th Mountain Division guys, they set up their own ski race uh, there in May. And uh, who do you think wins it? The greatest skier in the world, Walter Prager. And so now that the, they have to go over towards Trieste because uh, they have to stop uh, Tito from encroaching into Italy with the communist troops. So, but most of the 10th returns home uh, in July and they get on the, plan, on the boat and come home. So overall, the 10th Mountain Division during the war lost about a thousand guys. It was 998 that uh, were actually killed, over 4,000 wounded. This is, the, this is the cemetery outside of Florence. Um, and then they went back to climbing mountains. And this is uh, near, this is Gross Glockner in Austria. And uh, they went back and they had a ski, they had a climbing school again. Then they had a pretty, Famous, a bunch of their guys became pretty famous and did pretty well. Frank Sargent was a captain. He was a company commander of F Company of the 86th at one time. Bob Dole, he recovered from his wounds. He was never able to use his right hand again. He had to learn to sign his, his signature with his left hand. He would only shake with his left hand. And, but he ran for president in 96, I think. Um, David Brower, he ran the Sierra Club for like 25 years. Ben Duke, he went on to run uh, Gates Rubber Company. And Amber Merrill Hastings ran S Ski Magazine. Bill Bowerman was a major. He's a co-founder of Mikey, Nike Shoes. Over 62 different ski areas in America were founded by 10th Mountain guys or 10th Mountain guys ran the ski school. They were patrollers. They set up uh, lifts. They had it, everything to do with, uh, with the ski business around the whole America. And these were just Amer in Colorado. They uphold basin and ski broad steel winter park. Those all on mountain guys. 10th Mount Hut system set up by a guy named Fritz Benedict, who was an architect. He did a lot of the buildings in Aspen. 10th Mountain guys probably kick started the ski industry by 10 or 15 years when they came back and all those skis and everything came for, up for sale. This is the highway on the, out of Leadville on the way to Camp Hale. That's what Camp Hale looks like today. All of the buildings have been demolished. Um, this is the supply section uh, buildings. This is the back of the rifle range. All of these caves hold the targets. Uh, and this is where the targets were. And the guys who were shooting were way back down here. Um, this is the all that's left of the field house uh, where they had a lot of their dances and they had promotions and they had meetings and they had all kinds of things going on at field house. The only people that pack mules anymore is my old place uh, where I was stationed was the Mountain Warfare Training Center. This young Marine here, he's got two packed uh, mules and uh, the Marines are the ones that teach people how to pack mules now for uh, work in the mountains. This is a Tennessee Pass. This is the monument of Tennessee Pass. And this is what happens every year of Mule Day. We have a big celebration up there. <clears throat> this is where Ski Cooper is. You just go up the road back up that way and you're at Ski Cooper and you see uh, where these guys trained, uh, did their ski training. 
And uh, this was taken in 1914. This guy here is the one with his tongue sticking out um, in that picture I showed you that was taken at Camp Swift. He's gone, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. This is Dick, the guy in the blue jacket that's got Alzheimer's. He's still here and he's gone. So that was 14. Now this was 18. He's gone, he's still here. This is uh, John Tripp, he lives in Aspen, he's still with us. This guy, he's still with us, Perry, Perry Smith. He's, uh, he, he, was, he taught ski jumping at uh, Steamboat Springs. This is, this is uh, Sandy Treat, he was the guy in the green shirt. He's gone. This is Dick again. And this is Neil uh, Christie, he's gone too. So they're all going fast. Uh, this is the guy that took uh, Mussolini's castle. This is what they look like when they were young and strong 75 years ago. There's Minnie Dole, the founder, the guy that all got it started. Um, we wouldn't have had a 10th Mountain Division without Minnie Dole, uh, the, great, the great, good and great guy that had the, the foresight that we needed ski troops. This is the mountain, this is the marble uh, monument there at the, at, the, at the place I just showed you. These are the nine, all of these are the names. This is the 98, 998 names of the guys killed from uh, 10th Mountain Division during the war. This is Ski Coopers right back there behind this monument. And that's uh, it, Semper Avanti, uh, that's the division motto. It means always forward. Now, for a little, commercial uh, part on my part. These are the two books that I've co-written. Um, if you want one of these or both of these books, you can get them on Amazon. Um, and I'd appreciate it if you did, but if you don't, then that's okay too. I hope you like the, I hope you like the presentation. And uh, we're about the same time as I usually do it. Maybe a little bit over. Thanks for listening. Awesome work, Tom, for your uh, first ever virtual presentation. I say you did pretty dang well. Uh, Thanks, Kim. And uh, Thank you. we had a couple of comments on Facebook kind of relating to this, the veterans you were just chatting about. Um, a while back, someone said, Albert Sori, a veteran at 10th Mountain Division, 95 years old, is watching too. So that's pretty. Well, he's got to be, he's got to be 97. Um, the uh, I, Al has a great story. I mean, I, if he can hear me, I love the guy because um, I, when he was there with his company commander when he got killed in Italy, and Al was right there with him, um, and that guy uh, was a Colorado boy. Um, hold it, I got to get my book. Uh, Al, <laughs> um, Charlie Sanders is the one that told me that Al was still alive, um, and you know I, I would love just to talk to Al. Here he is, Joe Duncan. Um, he was a Colorado skier. He was a he was a downhill champion in 1934. He grew up in Estes Park, and Al was with him when he got killed. What else? Um, this is also a great, if anyone has any extra questions, uh, type them in now and we can answer them. I know Facebook is a little behind, but, um, there's a, another comment that asks or, or says, uh, my dad was at Riva one month past his 37th birthday. So I think that there's a, there's a good representation of family members and acquaintances of. Ask her if her dad was an officer. Yeah, Lisa, if, you, if you're still here, was your dad an officer? You can reply in the comments. Uh, and then there's another question that came through and it asked if we can access this video at a later time. Um, so we can. I recorded this webinar on Zoom and I'm going to post it to the YouTube, our YouTube channel, Friends of the Dillon Ranger District. Um, tomorrow that will be posted there. Uh, I posted it in the comments, so. Um, Lisa said her father was a medic. Okay, 37 is pretty old, okay? Because most of those guys were between 18 and 31. Um, 
it was hard to get in if you were older than that. Now this guy was, he was probably a doctor, uh, but he could, but you know, and it depended on how long he'd been in the army and uh, there's a lot of things like that. But Jill, there were a Sierra, some older- Three letter man. Was he, he was a three letter man? As a medic. That's what's said. That'd be good. And then uh, someone said, I thought Steamboat was founded by a local rancher. Well, no, if, if Steamboat was founded long, long ago. Um, it was, it predated, it was there way before the tent. Um, it wasn't founded by a tent guy, a guy worked there. There's guys that worked at Steamboat as patrollers or instructors or, and Crosby Perry Smith, um, he taught ski jumping. They still got Hollison Hill there, where they where they ski jump. Um, it's not very big, and it's but it's it's still there. And you could it's, it takes a lot more guts than I got to go down that ski jump. I'll tell you that. And then uh, just lots of people saying thanks, Tom, and how much they enjoyed the presentation. Uh, and then I want to echo their sentiment. It's we're so lucky. Friends of the Dillon Ranger District is so lucky to have you year after year, Tom, and it's such That's a my pleasure. presentation. You know, I like, I like doing it. I like giving it. Um, I, I, I think that people enjoy hearing it and uh, they, you know, and I'll keep on doing it as long as people want me to give it. So I'm yours or Cameron. Most excellent. Well, uh, I also want to thank everyone who tuned in. It seemed like we had a pretty great audience. Um, it's our largest audience we've had for one of our live webinars. So far, there was about 25 people tuned in the entire time, which is awesome. And then there'll be more people that can view this afterwards. So thanks everyone for tuning in. If you're yeah. itching for more education, we've got a, uh, another webinar two weeks from tonight. I believe it is the 25th. Let me double check real quick. Um, yeah, the 25th. At 4 p.m., Rick Higgs had to give a presentation on um, the gold rush and its effect on the United States. Um, he's kind of a local mining history expert. So if you're still itching for more, he's uh, it'll be a, an interesting one. Um, but yeah, thanks again to Tom and thanks again for everyone for tuning in. Uh, we'll sign off. Okay, thanks, Cameron.